Good afternoon. I feel like I need to turn this whole desk this way. So I'm going to talk this way. You're going to get a lot of, of one-sided there, but um, so glad you guys could be here today. Um, just before we get started, I always like to know, I see a lot of name badges, so that tells me you guys are professionals, but how many family loved one caregivers do we have? Okay. All right, so we've got a few. Okay, we're so glad you're here. So what we're going to be talking about today mostly is directed at, at family caregivers, loved one caregivers, because we're, we're talking about good self-care. What kinds of things can you be doing to take care of yourself? Because what we know is if you're not taking care of yourself, there's nothing left of you to take care of your loved ones. So for the um, professionals in the room, the things we're talking about are certainly things that you can take back and share with the families that you're working with. So uh, we will just go ahead and get started. I am going to save some time um, at the end. And clickers work much better when you turn them on. All right, so first of all, I want to take a look at who are the caregivers. Well, in the United States, I think these are 2016 numbers, but about 62% are, are female and 38% are male. About 60% are a child taking care of a parent. We've got about 15 million unpaid caregivers in the country. A lot of them, 67%, are between the ages of 50 and 64. Now think about that. The, the first age that you think about retiring is usually what in this country? 65. Now, a lot of us don't get to do that anymore, right? But 65, you think about retiring, 67% of caregivers are between the ages of 50 and 64. What does that mean? That means they're probably still working. At 50, you probably still have children in the home, right? Maybe they're high schoolers, but probably still have children in the home, and you take on being a caregiver. 42% say they work about nine hours a day giving care. And it gives you some numbers there about uh, how many hours they spend, how long they've been caregivers. So this is a huge, huge undertaking. And one of our big missions at Alzheimer's Tennessee is to provide support for the caregivers. We want to uh, be there, equip you, give you tools, and support you through this uh, caregiving journey that you're on. Now you wonder, or sometimes we ask why. Why did I become the caregiver? These are some of the reasons that people say, well, it's my job, or, well, I live the closest, all my siblings live away, or it's what I'm supposed to do. I'm honoring my loved one. I'm honoring my vows till death do us part. And some people say, well, nobody else would. You know, I stepped into this caregiving role because nobody else would. Nobody else would help. And so whatever the reason is, whatever the why is, thank you so much, whatever the why is for you becoming a caregiver, ultimately you made a choice to do that. Because even though it feels like you didn't have a choice, you did. If everybody else walked away and says, I'm not doing this, I'm not taking this on, you actually did have that choice. You just didn't take that choice. You chose to care for the person and take care of them. So we're here to uh, equip you and uh, give you some tools to help you do that. Now, we think about the daily reality of caregiving. It's a lot of this, right? It's give, 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 give. Give of yourself because they, they, they need something. They have a need. They need to take their medicine. So you give of yourself and you help. Or they need help going to the restroom. They need help showering. They need help dressing. All these needs. And your role as a primary caregiver is that you give, give, give all day long. And that's one of the wonderful parts of being a caregiver. But the problem with that is that sometimes you give completely out. You've given so much and you can't pour from an empty cup. So it's very, very important to talk about self-care for the caregiver. And I titled today's talk, Self-Care Isn't Self-ish, because so many caregivers say, oh, well, I can't, I can't leave him with a caregiver to go out and do something else. I'm the only one that knows how to take care of him, or I'm, I'm not going to go do that if he can't go with me, or it's wrong of me to ask for help. I promised uh, in sickness and in help till death do us part. It would be wrong to bring somebody else in. And there's all these reasons why they won't take care of themselves. But the biggest one is because they see it as being selfish. If I go and enjoy myself and take a break from this caregiving, I'm being selfish. And that's just not true. So the truth is, you can't pour from an empty cup. So the first thing I want you to think about today, and you have a handout with a little illustration that sort of looks like this, is think about what are those things that fill your cup? In other words, what are those what things that give you fulfillment, that give you joy, that make you happy? Maybe they're the things that you haven't done since you became a caregiver. And I want you to take that little uh, visual that I gave you and jot a few things down on there. And I've just got some ideas for you here. Maybe it's spending time with your children or grandchildren. Maybe it's your church activities. Maybe it's hobbies. Maybe it's social groups that you used to belong to. Um, 
who knows, exercise, talking to friends, whatever it is, you want to make sure that you uh, jot those things down. And on a day that you're really feeling that you're like completely up to here, completely spent, completely exhausted, go pull that list out. Find five minutes to try to do one of those things. If it's just sitting outside listening to the birds, the birds are so loud and happy right now. Just sit outside and listen to the birds for five minutes. Call your granddaughter that lives in California for five minutes. Find out how her play went that you weren't able to get to. Uh, call your church friends and say, you know, I, I really can't get there. Can you just drop by one day? We'll have a cup of coffee. I've got to stay here with my husband, but could you just drop by? That would be amazing. Whatever you need to do, find five minutes take a deep breath and do one of these things that fills you up because here's the thing that caregivers forget and that is themselves when you become a caregiver it becomes your number one job and it takes up a lot of your time and a lot of your day and that is fantastic if you're caring for someone and giving it all you got that is a wonderful thing but you need to remember that you are still a person and you need to remember who you were before this disease entered your life and you became a full-time caregiver. So find those things that fill your cup. Make sure you're still finding time to do those things that make you who you are and bring you joy. Now I have kind of a riddle here and let's see if anybody knows the answer to this. And this is kind of a new riddle, so even some of you may not have heard this one yet. But what do caregivers and Cleopatra have in common? Any guess? If you're a caregiver, you have something in common with Cleopatra. Do you know? What did you say? Denial, yes. So Cleopatra was the queen of the Nile. Caregivers often find themselves in denial. So that's kind of a silly play on words, but it's to introduce us to the next thing I want to talk about. And that is what an enemy denial is in a caregiver's life. Denial speak. I can handle it. It's really no big deal. I don't need help. We're doing just fine. Well, dad's always been a little forgetful. He's just a little more forgetful. Those are the kinds of things we're saying when we're not addressing, oh, he doesn't need to go to the doctor. It's fine. We're, we're not going to go to the doctor. Everything is fine. Right? And you, you professional caregivers, you've heard some of your family say those kinds of things, right? When you go in, oh, we don't really need any help. Maybe the daughters or the kids called and said, please, we want to hire you. Oh, yeah, we're fine. We've got this. All right? So that's denial speak. And it can be very dangerous. And this is why. When you're denying that there's an issue, it prevents you from seeking a diagnosis. Now, the thing about seeking a diagnosis for a memory issues or cognitive issues is there can be very good news. Sometimes you can go and seek a diagnosis or an evaluation, and guess what? You can and find out this is an untreated UTI and with antibiotics mom will get better or this is a reaction to a medication and if we deal with that mom will get better or this is some other health issue depression if we treat the depression dad will get better depression mimics dementia so much it's actually called pseudo dementia guess what depression is treatable so the great news is if you will go and have that evaluation at the earliest possible time after you suspect something is going on you may get the news that oh this isn't dementia at all this is this other thing and we can treat that so there's a, it's a reversible cause so that's fantastic the other thing about uh, being in denial is it delays you from starting treatment if you don't go get the diagnosis you can't start treatment Everything we know from the medical community right now tells us that, that the earlier you start, or start treatment for dementia, the earlier in the process you start it, the better results you're going to have. So we want to get people started on the appropriate treatment as early as we possibly can. And if you put off going and getting evaluated and getting a diagnosis, you can't do that. And also prevents you from seeking and accepting help. See, if I don't have a problem, I don't need help, right? If everything is fine, I don't need help. And think about the common thing that happens. And we see this a lot uh, maybe uh, after someone has died and you're at the visitation after a funeral and we hear 500 people say, well, let me know if you need anything. Just anything you need, just give us a call. And the person who's going through that generally is never going to call because they're not going to be able to recognize what they need because they're in a state of crisis. When you're a caregiver, all of your focus is on your caregiving role. And so often you don't even recognize that you're tired or that there is a need there. So you certainly won't ask for it. So the longer you're using that denial speak, everything's fine, we've got this covered, I can handle it, it's no big deal, the longer it's going to take you to seek and accept help. And that's going to lead to exhaustion and burnout. Um, sometimes people ask me, uh, when do you know it's time to get in home help? Or when do you know that it's time maybe to, to place someone in an assisted living facility? And I say when the caregiver is completely exhausted, 
when it becomes dangerous or when that person needs more care than a, a, the best caregiver in the world can give in a 24-hour day. Because here's the thing, you can't stay awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You just can't do it. You might want to, you might have the desire to do it, you physically can't do it. And that's when it's time to maybe bring in some help, to, to accept that help, to let somebody else help you with this because you will absolutely exhaust yourself. And when you exhaust yourself and end up in the hospital because you've run yourself ragged, who's going to take care of your loved one then? See, it's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? My goal is to be the one taking care of my loved one, so I'm going to do everything for them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I'm the only one that can do it. But then you wear yourself out, and you're gone, and then who's going to take care of that person? So it's so important to deal with that, and that leads to caregiver stress, which we'll talk about in a minute, because caregivers very frequently will say, but I'm not stressed. I'm fine. This is what I'm supposed to do. I'm his wife. I'm supposed to do this. That's my mom. My mom took great care of me. I'm going to take care of him. I'm not stressed. I'm not stressed, right? For some reason in our country, stress is like a dirty word, but it's not. Stress is an absolutely normal part of living. In fact, if we didn't experience a little bit of stress, then when we saw somebody running at us with a knife, we'd just stand there and go, oh, hey, that's a nice knife you've got. And of course we don't do that, that's silly, right? The point is we experience that stress, that adrenaline gets pumping, lets our bodies know, I've either gotta run away from this guy or I've gotta be ready to fight him. That's called the fight or flight response, right? You probably learned about that in high school. But if we don't acknowledge that we're stressed, we have no way of dealing with it. But we don't wanna say, I'm really stressed out because we think that that means lots of really ugly things that it doesn't mean at all. So let's take a look at caregiver stress, and it's important to know that caregiver stress is the number one threat to a caregiver's well-being, the number one. So if you do not acknowledge and deal with the stress that this naturally brings into your life, it's going uh, it's gonna to get you. It's going to cause some problems. So we want to look at what some of the common causes of stress are. And the number one is you're completely responsible for another human being now. Now, if you're a parent, you may say, well, yeah, I, I had kids. I was completely responsible for them, too. But it was different. It's a different thing to be completely responsible for a baby that you know can't do anything for themselves and then to become completely responsible for an adult, especially an adult that maybe had a Ph.D. or an adult that used to uh, run the hospital or an adult that did all these other things. It's it just there's something in our brain that finds it very confusing that this 70 year old person needs me to help them tie their shoes. It just doesn't compute. So that's a real stressful thing. If I say to my mom, hey mom, and, and we're gonna look at this one in a minute, mom get your shoes on, we're getting ready to go to the doctor, and if I leave the room, I'm gonna come back. Mom's shoes are not gonna be touched, right? And I'm gonna get frustrated because she's 70 and she ought to know how to put her shoes on, right? And I'm becoming responsible for having to do that. So that causes stress. And increased pressures from decision making. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know much about mortgages or homeowners insurance or any of all that paperwork. It makes me a crazy person. So I don't know how to do all that stuff. So let's say, you know, I'm married, my spouse gets dementia and is no longer able to take care of those things, suddenly I've got to start taking care of all kinds of things that I don't know how to do. I've got to take care of the checkbook. I've got to make decisions about their treatment. Maybe I've got three children and my three children don't agree on anything. So I say, oh, the doctor wants to put him on this medication. And my one daughter says, mom, that medication causes cancer. Don't you know that? You can't put dad on that. And another one says, well, mom, you know dad can't go on that medication because there's this problem or that problem. And then the other daughter is like, well, have you thought about this? Or maybe you should do that. And all these decisions, there's a lot of pressure on you as a caregiver to make decisions. And then uh, taking care of the responsibilities that loved one wants Handled. If they've always paid the bills and I've never even written a check, that's going to be a stressful transition for me to take over that role. Then there's the disruption in life and lifestyle. And maybe we traveled all the time and all of a sudden we're not going to get to do that anymore. That's a stressful thing. Or maybe instead of being able to go visit the grandkids uh, once a month, I'm not going to get to see them for six months or a year because it's just too difficult to, to load my spouse up and, and put them in the car and go and do that. Maybe we played bridge with the same people for the last 30 years and we're no longer able to do that. It causes disruptions in your life and your lifestyle. And then the isolation from family and friends because it's just difficult. And sometimes caregivers will determine, I really want to go visit the kids and the grandkids it's just not worth the effort anymore. It just becomes too difficult. So they become isolated from their family and friends and don't have those uh, 
social things fulfilled in their lives. The other thing about caregivers is it's you're on alert 24-7. And if you've ever known anybody who is in the, the military, they will tell you that is one of the most exhausting parts about it because they have to be on high alert 24-7. They never know when something's going to happen. They just know it could happen any minute now. And when you're a caregiver, you're on that alert 24-7. And our bodies just aren't meant to be on high alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It'll wear them down. So that's one of the big causes of caregiver stress as well. And then we find very often that caregivers are doing everything alone. Uh, we are a mobile society. I'll be the first one to tell you I do not like it. I have a daughter in California and a son in Nashville. I don't know who told them they could grow up and move away from mom, but that's what they did. So if I have a problem, guess what? My son's two and a half hours away. My daughter's across the country. So sometimes you find yourself having to take care of everything alone just because people aren't around because they've moved away. Sometimes you take care of things alone because uh, let's say I'm one of three siblings and I live right next door to, to mom and dad. It's easy for me to run in there and do that and my siblings who live a couple of hours away are going to really like that because they can just back off and let me handle everything, right? And it's not uncommon at all that there can be two, three, four, five siblings and one of the kids ends up doing everything. So very often that stress is because you handle everything alone or you're doing all the work, but they've got all the opinions, right? And that's a really stressful thing too. You're like, well, you know, if you think you can do it better, come on over and, and, and help out here. So caregivers, I said, you kind of have something in, in um, common with Cleopatra, but caregivers are also like superheroes. Somebody tell me what that is. That's a bat signal. It's not, well, it's not Batman, but it's the bat signal. So what did the bat signal do? Something was going on in Gotham City. They'd flash the bat signal up in the sky. And then what happened? Dun, 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 Batman responded, right? So Batman saw the bat signal. He knew there was a need. Batman comes running. Okay, caregivers, you've got a bat signal. It's called your loved one's voice. They say, I need help. You go running. I need uh, my medicine, you go running. I'm thirsty, you go running. I need help getting dressed, you go running, right? You got your own bat signal and you're Batman. But there's a big difference between the way Batman handled those kinds of things and the way that most caregivers that I meet handle things. And here's what the trick is. Batman was a superhero of the highest level. We all know who he is, but he had a sidekick, right? So even somebody as amazing as Batman with the cool car knew Taking care of everybody in Gotham City is a bigger job than I can do by myself. I need help, right? So if Batman, a superhero, can admit that he needs a sidekick, caregivers, we're gonna have to accept that sometimes. That sometimes you're gonna need a sidekick as well. And we're gonna talk about who some of those sidekicks are today. Now we talked about being in denial and why admitting that you need help is so difficult. Let's take a look at some of the things that we say to ourselves. Did you all know that you talk to yourself all day long? The average person has about 62,000 random thoughts a day. 62,000 thoughts just popping in your head. And we love to say that woulda, coulda, shoulda, oughts, all those kinds of things. Oh, I should have handled that better. I should have done a better job at that. I could have been more patient. I, you know, we, we beat ourselves up very much. And these are some of the things that caregivers say. If I ask for help, it's a sign of weakness. Remember Batman. When you think that one and say that one to yourself, that it's a sign of weakness. Remember Batman had a sidekick? Um, if I ask somebody else to come and take care of him, it's like saying, I don't want to do it anymore or that I don't love him. Right? Caregivers have said these things. If I admit that I need somebody to come in and help, it's like me giving up. We don't like to give up. We don't like to say that. It's not caring. Nobody can take care of him like I can. I've been his wife for 50 years. I have taken care of him for 50 years. No, no, he's not going to like anybody else making his bed. You know, he won't like anybody else cooking his dinner because they won't make it like I do, right? So it's like, I, I, I love him. I'm going to do this because I care. And if I get somebody else to do it, I'm not caring anymore, right? It's selfish. Asking for help means I want somebody else to do this because I don't want to do it anymore. I'm selfish because I want to go to the play uh, that my granddaughter is in tonight so I'm gonna have somebody else come and stay with my husband it's it's selfish of me to go and I shouldn't go to that play all right so we think we're selfish married people say it's not honoring my vows I once uh, knew a gentleman he was a, a pastor of a very very large church and um, he was taking care of his wife 
And all you can imagine, a very large church. He was a pastor there for like 20 years. Everybody knew them. And all these little ladies were coming over. Uh, we'd like to do this for you. Can we do that? Can we do this? And he turned them all away saying, she is my wife. I made a vow. I, I will take care of her. And I, I talked to that man, oh gosh, months, and finally convinced him, you know, it is taking care of her to take care of yourself. Because you've got a big job here and these people are stepping in to help you. He felt like it would not be honoring his vows if he allowed somebody else to come in and help take care of her. And that's simply not true. Sometimes taking care of people looks different. It, it looks different when we're dealing with Alzheimer's disease and dementia. It's admitting I can't handle it. And we are proud folks in America. We don't ever like to admit that we can't handle something. Uh, and that's not true either. So those are all the things, some of the reasons that make it so hard to ask for help because these are the things that we believe and the things that we say to ourselves. But it's important to realize none of these are true. I wish I knew how to make a, a big red X go over that. That's simply not true. Admitting that you need help is the first step to things getting better for you, to getting less stressful. All right, so maybe I am stressed. Well, we're still going to consider stress a, a bad word, so we won't use the word stress. But if I am stressed, what might that look like? And for you all, the uh, professional caregivers, if you're working with somebody, a lot of you will do the caregiver stress assessment. They'll tell you all day long, oh, I'm not stressed. I'm doing fine. But maybe they'll admit, well, yeah, I've been a little short-tempered lately. Things seem to get on my nerves a little more than they normally do. And, well, no, I haven't really seen my friends in six months or so. I just haven't gotten out of the house. But, that, you know, that's okay. I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, I worry all the time, but that's just part of it, right? I'm, I'm anxious. It, does it keep you awake at night? Yeah, I'm, I've had some sleepless nights. Um, okay, how are you? Are you are you tired? Are you exhausted? Oh boy, am I tired? I'm so exhausted. Um, sleeplessness. How many hours of sleep are you getting tonight? Well, he's up and down all night, so I'm up and down all night. I'm not really getting any sleep, or I just lie in bed and worry, so I'm not sleeping well, right? All of these are signs of stress. But they're kind of backdoor ways into assessing a person's stress level. So if you're a professional caregiver, these are some of the kinds of things that you know to look for when you're talking to a caregiver. And if you're a family caregiver, pay attention to these things in your own life. If it's too hard to admit this is very stressful, can you admit that things kind of get on your nerves a little more than they used to? Can you admit that you haven't had a conversation with a friend in three months? People that you used to talk to on a regular basis because all those are signs that the stress is getting a little much. Irritability is one as well. Now this one really scares a lot of people and I have had a number of caregivers say I just can't remember anything anymore. I, I forget when things are. I forget where I put stuff. I forget we had doctor's appointment. I think maybe I'm getting this too. So I always like to point out to caregivers, right? You, you understand that. I like to point out to caregivers that stress causes you to be forgetful. Your brain can only handle so much at one time. And if you're handling all the caregiving and remembering everything that two, you used to have two brains remembering everything, now it's all relying on one. If you're taking care of every doctor's appointment, every medication, everything, you may, from that stress experience, difficulty concentrating and forgetfulness. So understand that's part of it. Don't let that frighten you. Uh, Alzheimer's and the other diseases that cause dementia are not contagious. So it's not that you're getting it too. That's just, that's kind of how it goes when you get too exhausted. The other thing we're really concerned about with caregiver stress is it can cause health problems of your own. In fact, um, studies show that caregivers tend to get sick with a little, uh, whatever the bug of the day is that's going around. Caregivers will get that more often than the person they're caring for will because they wear themselves out so much. So that's something to be concerned about too. And this is the point that a lot of people get to before they finally admit, maybe I do need help with this. Maybe this is a bigger job than just me. And our goal at Alzheimer's Tennessee is not to let you get to that point. So we want to give you some tools today for caring for yourself, caring for your loved one, so that this is not the point at which you finally admit, maybe, uh, maybe I might need to talk to somebody. So there's two important facts I want to share with you today, and, and just I'll drill these in as we go throughout the day, and that is it is not selfish, not, not selfish to make yourself a priority once in a while. It's not selfish. And also, it is not weak to ask for help. All right, so it's not selfish to make yourself a priority once in a while, and it is not weak to ask for help. In fact, it's absolutely necessary. And so I just want to practice saying those things out loud if we can. If you all will repeat after me, you know, it's okay to take care of my needs. Because you need to hear yourself say it to believe it. It's okay to take care of my needs. 
Maybe one person said that. It's okay to take care of my needs. It's okay to take care of my needs. It absolutely is. Thank you. And it's okay to ask for help. It is okay to ask for help. And the more you say that to yourself and start to believe it, the better uh, place you're going to be as a caregiver. Now, one thing that really sets us up for a lot of stress is when we talk about our expectation versus the reality. And I, I've got Wiley Cody. He seems to be the theme of today. But Wiley Cody is up there. And for those of us old enough to remember uh, when cartoons were really, really good, uh, that old Wiley Cody, every, he tried to catch the Roadrunner. And the only thing is, his only go-to was he would order some new contraction from the Acme company. Somehow it magically appeared in the desert. I never did figure that out, but it magically appeared. He would try this contraption, no Roadrunner. But he didn't learn from it. He'd call Acme again, order the next contraption, set it out there, no Roadrunner. That poor, he tried everything, right? But what did he do? His mistake was he kept doing the same thing over and over and over, even though it clearly was not working. So here's a fact. We sometimes make things harder on ourselves than they have to be. Wiley Cody could have tried something new and different and it might have worked better. He might not have been so hungry, but he kept doing the same thing over and over that wasn't working. So we need to pay attention to that. If your approach to caring for your loved one isn't getting you the results you need or is upsetting them or causing more problems, it's probably time to re-examine our approach and, and realize that we're sometimes making things harder on ourselves. One of the ways that we do that is when we ask someone with Alzheimer's to do things that they no longer have the ability to do. All right. So if I'm asking them to remember something, that's going to be frustrating. If they no longer are capable of getting dressed by themselves, but I'm looking at my 70-year-old father going, he's been dressing himself for you know 65 years, and lay his clothes out and go in and he can't figure it out, or maybe he's putting them on backwards or whatever, I'm creating that frustration because I'm expecting him to do something that he really can no longer do. So one of the big things as caregivers that we have to do is adjust our expectations. We've got to change our expectations because sometimes our expectations create more problems or more stress than the reality itself. So think about the difference. If I lay the clothes out, Dad, get dressed, we got to go to the doctor's appointment, and I expect him to be able to do that, and I leave the room and come back and Dad's nowhere near dressed. That's a very different thing than if I acknowledge the reality of dad can't dress himself anymore. I need to allow 20 extra minutes today getting him ready to go to the doctor because I know I'm going to have to go help him dress. Now, which one of those do you think is less stressful? The second one, right? Which one do you think most of us do? The first one, right. So one thing we want to think about today is in your caregiving role, are there things that you're doing that are making it more stressful than it has to be. And one of the biggest ones is our expectation. So since we can't change the reality, we can't change the fact that our loved one has this disease, we must change our expectations. The person that we're taking care of can't change. So we're the ones that have to change. And mostly that's in our approach, the way we look at things, the way we approach some of these things. So I mentioned uh, asking mom or dad to put their shoes on. And we think that's a simple request. If a person is 70 years old, we can safely assume they've been putting their shoes on and tying them for at least you know, 64, 65 years, right? We learned that around five years old or so. So um, put your shoes on, tie your shoes, we're going to the doctor. Well, these are some of the things that make that a difficult uh, request for someone with Alzheimer's disease. And we've got one of the handouts over here talks about the five A's of Alzheimer's. So uh, one of them is aphasia. With aphasia, I don't understand what you're saying. Aphasia is that loss of words, that loss of understanding, that loss of language skills. So um, I, I speak a different language. So je parle en français, j'ai étudié sept ans. Did anybody in here understand that? That would be really frustrating if I kept speaking French to you, wouldn't it? Okay. Um, so that's about what it's like. You know I'm saying something to you. You know I'm asking you to do something but you don't understand what it is because that loss of, of language skill is there. With amnesia, remember earlier I said, hey mom, uh, get your shoes on, we're getting ready to go to the doctor, and I left the room and I went to do something else because our lives are busy, right? Well, the minute I walked out the door, maybe the dog ran in or mom looked out the window and saw a bird, she's already forgotten what I asked her to do. So when I go back in there expecting her, because I have the expectation, right? I'm expecting her to have her shoes on, I need to remember that amnesia. If I tell someone to do something, and I walk away, chances are pretty high it's not going to get done because they are going to forget. 
With agnosia, we kind of forget what commonly recognized items are. Like, what is the shoe anyway? What do you use it for? Uh, you might say, put your shoe on, and they might be looking around the room at, at other objects in the room because they, they know there's something in there they're supposed to be doing. Don't quite understand what a shoe is. And then with apraxia, uh, there comes a point where the brain and the muscles just don't communicate with doing all that. And there's a lot of steps in tying a shoe, right? So you got to cross them and put it through the loop and pull it. So th they just can't make their hands do that activity anymore. And apraxia is what in later Alzheimer's disease leads to what y'all call the Alzheimer's shuffle when you see somebody kind of dragging that foot. Their brain just isn't communicating that you pick your feet up and put one in front of the other. So you'll see that sometimes with forgetting how to do things. And then with anomia, I can't even find the words to let you know that I don't understand what you asked me to do. I know you asked me to do something, but I, I can't even put in, in words. I'm sorry, what was that you asked me to do? Or, or can you tell me that again? The other thing for caregivers is that you're often dealing with a variety of feelings. And unfortunately, we tend to label feelings. We say there's good feelings and bad ones, right? Things like happiness and joy and excitement. We want to label those the good feelings. And then anger, sadness, frustration, we want to label those the bad feelings. Feelings are just feelings. You can't control how you feel. We all got to leave here and go get in cars. And some of us will be going through town. And, and on the interstate, there are many, often, a lot of things people do on the interstate, right? They can make you angry for a minute. You go, I can't believe that guy pulled right over in front of me. And you might feel that, ugh, that frustration, right? That's normal. Somebody cuts you off on the interstate, you might feel that, right? That's a normal feeling. Now, if I chase him down, I-40, <laughs> and try to run him down the road, that's a problem. Okay, see the difference? So having that feeling, having that initial emotional reaction, that's fairly normal. You really don't have a lot of control over that. It becomes an issue when you start acting on it. So I want to look at some of the feelings that are very, very normal for caregivers. A lot of these things you feel and then maybe uh, beat yourself up for feeling them because of all those shoulda, woulda, coulda, oughts that we tell ourselves every day, right? And one is frustration. This is a very, very frustrating job. It is very hard to look at a 70-year-old PhD and understand that they can no longer do something as simple as, as get dressed and put their shoes on. That It doesn't make sense frustrating and it gets frustrating that we have to uh, step in and do all these things for them. Uh, maybe sometimes you experience disappointment and you feel guilty for that. We all know that our loved one didn't ask to get this disease but if you were planning to uh, build a, a, a lake house or you were planning to go on that cruise to Alaska or whatever and now you're not going to be able to do some of those things because of this you might feel disappointment that's a perfectly normal feeling. Sometimes you might even feel angry you know, there's a lot that goes into it. And again, the frustration of, of telling someone or having them ask you 10 times a day something, you can sometimes feel angry, all right? Remember the person cutting you off on the road? It's a temporary feeling. You can acknowledge it. You just don't want to act on it. And acting on that with caregiving would be maybe, you know, yelling at them or, or taking your frustration out on them in some way. So that would be a problem. But just admitting that, you know, sometimes this just makes me angry. That's okay. You can admit that. Um, sometimes you may feel helpless. It's, it's overwhelming uh, in your caregiving role. And sometimes you're just going to feel helpless. You may even feel embarrassed. And I want to I take a minute to talk about that one because when you go out with someone and your loved one says or does something that draws attention, it's a perfectly normal human response to be a little embarrassed. Everybody's looking at you and, and you want to try to explain. Um, I didn't bring them with me, but if any of you need them at Alzheimer's Tennessee, we do have some little cards. They're like little business cards that you can carry with you. And if your loved one does do something out in public and you know people are looking or, or they're reacting or whatever, it's just a little card you can hand them that says, please excuse my friend, they have Alzheimer's disease. And it's a wonderful way to just kind of address that situation. But also, you know, it's education because you're, you're sharing that with that person. But, you know, sometimes you might be embarrassed and that's okay. Sometimes you might feel jealous. Maybe Bob and Sue are your best friends for 50 years and they're still going and doing all these things and they're going to see their grandson's graduation from college and you're not going to get to go. Sometimes we might feel a little jealous and we're resentful. Oftentimes we may feel very, very lonely as caregivers. Remember that social isolation we talked about. And then they all lead to the biggie, which is guilt. And caregiver guilt is a huge, huge burden to carry. It's actually like carrying around a huge bag of rocks on your back. All those woulda, coulda, shouldas, oughts, those will wear you down, just like carrying around a bag of rocks. So what I want to say to you about all those feelings is 
they're just feelings. If they're not good feelings, bad feelings, ones that you should not feel, they're just feelings. But here's the trick. They're all normal as long as you don't get stuck there. So if you find yourself being frustrated and the next day you're still frustrated and a week longer you're still just so frustrated you can't function, then it's time to maybe talk to somebody. Maybe a, a friend, a pastor, attend a support group. I brought the calendars in for our support groups because uh, when you're a caregiver dealing with somebody else in the same position as you, who's going through the same thing, it's just a wonderful place to go, share your frustrations, learn from somebody else who's on the same path. So the thing about uh, those feelings and the guilt too is that that can lead to overwhelming um, anxiety and depression. And uh, depression is treatable, but it, it can really wear you down if you start feeling that way. You just can't get out of bed. You can't do the things that you need to be doing for yourself or your loved one. So feel the feelings briefly acknowledge this is okay this is just a part of it if you're able to move on that's great if you feel like you're getting stuck in any of those then we want to look at uh, talking to somebody and again a pastor a friend somebody who's been through it before um, so some of the things that you can do to manage caregiver stress and we already mentioned developing those realistic expectations so I need to learn that I cannot expect my loved one to do the things I used to be able to do I can no longer expect my loved one to do the things that everybody else their age may be doing. All of our friends may still be doing. So I've got to develop those realistic expectations. Another thing that's very helpful is making plans in advance and thinking things out. Remember in the example I talked about of, of I have to help my mom get dressed now? Well, if I'm expecting her to be ready at 10 minutes to the hour because we're walking out the door, I've set myself up. So I've got to plan in advance. All right, it's going to take me an extra 30 minutes to get mom ready. So I need to start this 30 minutes earlier than I used to have to and just doing that and also making plans in advance for what is your long-term plan instead of getting into a crisis situation and then having to deal with it what are you thinking would you hire in-home help uh, would you potentially move closer to your kids would you have to move out of your house uh, in Tennessee you know, you've got a lot of those houses that they call split foyers you walk in the front door and you're nowhere you just there's a foyer you got to go up or down those are not very good houses for people to live in when they get older so right now do we need to think about moving do we need to move to a one level do we need to equip the house so that it'll be safer for our loved ones make those plans in advance none of us makes good decisions when we're in a crisis mode we just go with whatever's quickest and easiest at the time so that's not the best time to be making a decision then you want to establish your limits okay as a human being you have limits and sometimes when we reach our limit, it feels like we've run into a brick wall. So think about what those are in advance and what are you going to do about it. So my, my son and I have had this conversation and I've said, these are the things that would be okay for you taking care of me and these are the things I think would be really uncomfortable for both of us. So if it ever gets to the point where you have to do this, this, or this, I want you to know it's okay to bring somebody in to help. You don't have to do that. because. That just would be strange, all right? So you can have those conversations, but understand what are your limits and don't feel guilty about them. If you're a female and you think helping your father go to the restroom, it would just be too difficult for you, that's okay. Acknowledge it and know when it gets to that point, that's when we know we're gonna have to hire some help or get somebody, get somebody else in here. So know what your limits are because one of the things that's stressful is when we try to push ourselves way beyond our limits or our comfort zone because we think we're supposed to, right? So kind of know what those are. And then don't make those promises that you can't keep. I think this is getting to be uh, less and less of an issue, but boy, I remember growing up and grandparents would always look at that, that their kids or grandkids and say, don't ever put me, don't ever put me in a home. You can take care of me, don't you ever put me in a home. You promise me you'll never put me in a home. And this was a huge thing. Everybody would make these promises. So I encourage you, don't make promises that you can't keep because we never know what the future's gonna hold. And remember we talked earlier about when it gets to the point where they need somebody with them 24 hours a day to be safe and they have more needs than you can meet because you're only one person, there may come a time where they need either in-home help or an assisted living or something else for their own safety and for yours. So it's much easier to make that decision to transition them to a care facility if you've never made that promise. Because we, we don't like breaking promises, right? That's a, that's a big guilt inducer. And then learn to ask for and accept help. 
No, we've got to admit that it's okay. We already said that. Everybody said it out loud, so I hope you believed yourselves. But yeah, sometimes you got to ask for and accept help, and that's okay. The other thing that's really important about being a caregiver is just learning to forgive yourself daily. You know, at night when you go to bed, instead of beating yourself up, I should have done this differently. I ought not have done that. I wish I had done this. Today's done. Just say, you know, I did the best I could today. Tomorrow's a new day. And let it go. Because beating yourself up is really just going to add more rocks into that guilt that's heaping up on your bag. Find a way to laugh daily. You've heard that old expression that laughter is the best medicine. There's so much truth to that. There's so much evidence that just having a good hearty laugh. So if you like knock knock jokes, get a book on knock knock jokes. If you like old Andy Griffiths, watch an old Andy Griffith. Find something in your life that just brings you that joy and find a minute in your day to just, just have a giggle at whatever it is. Sometimes it may even mean laughing at some of the situations you and your loved one find yourselves in. Now that's not laughing at them. We're not going to laugh at them. But sometimes some of the things that they do can 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 be humorous. You know, we can kind of find a way to laugh at that. So find something that you can laugh at every day. And then sometimes you've just got to walk away. If things are getting too frustrating, the more you push and the more you try to, to prove your point or, or convince someone, the more stressful and difficult it's going to be. Sometimes you just have to say, I'm going to go in, my, rest, in the, my room or to the restroom. I'll be back in a minute. And just walk away from that. All right. And then you've got that little handout about keeping your cup full. So make sure you find a way to do those things and practice some good self-care. And we're going to be talking about more of those things. So uh, attending a support group. I mentioned that briefly already. But attending a support group is one of the very best things you can do for self-care. Uh, I can stand here. Linda can stand here. We can tell you all kinds of things about Alzheimer's disease and caregiver issues. But when you sit at a table with other wives, other husbands, other sons and daughters, and hear them say the same thing that you're going through, or hear them share the same fears or concerns that you have, it's a whole different ballgame. So we do have a list of the support groups over there, and I strongly, strongly encourage you to find one in your area and attend it. You can call a trusted friend, family member, or clergy member. Now I want to put a, a caveat on that, and that's this. You want to call, the, the, the key word there is trusted. So if you call someone and their approach to you is, well, you know, if I were you, right? If I were you, I would have done it this way. Or, well, you know, what you ought to do is this. If they always want to criticize you, sometimes this is a family member. They want to tell you how they would have done it differently or how you should have done it or why the way you did it was wrong. When you're overwhelmed, that's not the person to call. And you know what? That's okay. If it's your best friend, but she just doesn't have the gift of encouragement and supporting you, don't call your best friend. Find out who it is that you can call that'll just say, gosh, Cheryl, that must be really tough. What can I do for you? How can I help? You just want to talk, I will listen. You know, find the people and the people that don't make you feel guilty for the things that you might say. And that's why support groups are such a great option because everybody in there is going through the same thing. They're a pretty safe place to share the, the concerns that you have. Do everything that you can to maintain those relationships, though, with friends, family, groups you used to belong to. I mean, imagine how difficult it is if you've been part of the, the ladies' group at church for the past 30 years and suddenly you don't go anymore. You not only have become a caregiver, but you've lost something that was a very important part of your life for 30 years. It might need to look a little bit differently. Maybe instead of you always going to the functions, you say, can we just meet at my house for coffee one night? I would just love to see you girls. I miss you. Or um, maybe they can videotape uh, some of the events and things that you weren't able to go to and share those with you. Or you can get on the phone and talk about things with them. With all the technology we have now, it's, it's wonderful. FaceTime and Google, all those things. You can have like a virtual visit with three or four friends at a time. So you might need to make use of that, but try to maintain those contacts with those folks. Um, exercise is something that if you have never exercised a day in your life and you start today when you leave, you will reap benefits. Uh, there have been studies that show that, that show that it, it impacts you from the day you start, things are better for you. Exercise is the number one thing for stress relief, and it's also the number one thing for preventing um, other health issues. So our bodies are made up of a lot of muscles, and muscles are meant to move. So get some exercise, make sure you're getting enough sleep, 
and eating healthy. So the recommendations now for eating for brain health is called the MIND diet, M-I-N-D. You can get information on that, but an easy way to think about it is if it's good for your heart, it's good for the brain. There's been a lot of good uh, information put out about a heart healthy diet in recent years and what they're finding is all those things are also really good for taking care of your brain. So make sure you're eating a healthy diet. Caregivers often make sure that their loved one is fed and then they're not making sure that they're getting fed as well and they need to have that stuff too. Then there's a, a growing field in the um, counseling and, and psychology areas called mindfulness or grounding. And mindfulness is just a way to reduce stress because you kind of bring yourself back to this present moment. And I'm going to show you how to do one of those exercises in a little bit. It's very, very simple, but it just draws you back to the right here, right now. We spend a lot of time in two areas that we have absolutely no control over, and that's the past. We can't change it, and the future, we can't predict it. We worry about things. So I'm a big fan of the serenity prayer. If you know that one, it's God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Boy, isn't that a tough order. <laughs> accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things that I can, but the biggie is the wisdom to know the difference. And that's a tough one sometimes. We, we try to fix all kinds of things that we really have no control over, or we worry about problems that may never happen. Mindfulness reminds us right here, right now, is what you can impact. So let's, let's bring our focus back to right here, right now. And then more positive self-talk. Remember all those things I had just say earlier, it's okay to ask for help. You know, I did a good job today. Tomorrow is a new day. I'll try something different. You're doing as good of a job as anybody else could be doing in this situation. Positive self-talk. We go through the day talking to ourselves. You don't recognize it as talking to yourself, but if you start paying attention to your own voice inside your head, caregivers often are saying things like, I should have done a better job, I shouldn't have done that, I really messed up, how could I do that? And we really question and talk negatively to ourselves. So this slide is about, uh, can you find three minutes a day? And it's just to breathe or count. So in your handouts, you've got a, a little sheet like this that says exercises to address caregiver stress. One of them is called square breathing. So if you'll just, um, Put your finger on your desk or on a paper, whatever you've got. When you're feeling yourself getting really stressed, you can just take a couple of minutes to do this exercise. And what you want to do is really take a deep breath in. And the way that you know you've got a deep breath is you put your hand on your abdomen, not up here. These are shallow breaths, but put it here. And you want to make your belly rise. So try that. Just try to breathe in really deeply through your nose and make your belly rise. So most of the time we're trying to suck our bellies in. Hold that. And then just blow it out. You don't have to make a whole lot of noise. Do a couple of those and as you're doing that I'm going to show you how to do the rest of this exercise. So with square breathing all you're going to do is draw a square with your finger wherever you're at whatever you have in front of you and as you're going across the top you're going to inhale. This is about three seconds but your square might be bigger than mine so it doesn't matter. So we're just going to start with this finger and take a deep breath and draw the first line. So. And then as I'm going down, I'm going to exhale that breath. Then I've got to do the bottom, so we're going to breathe in again. And then we're going to exhale as we go up. And that's causing you to focus on a couple of things. Your breath and drawing that square correctly, <laughs> right? Drawing those four lines. When you're doing that, it's amazing how you can't focus on everything else going on. You will find yourself focusing on that. So that's a really quick, easy, uh, stress relieving technique that works. And the other one on here is the 54321 method. So again, if you can just walk away, if you feel yourself getting stressed, go into another room, make sure your loved one is safe, go in another room and do this 54321. So I'll guide you through this one. If you'll look around the room, just want to find five things that you see in the room and just list them. Like I see a table, I see chairs, I see a whiteboard, I see a microphone, whatever. And then four is things that you can feel. If you're not thinking about this, you don't recognize the body sensations you've got going on, but I feel myself sitting in the chair. I feel my back against it. I feel my eye itching from allergies. I feel uh, I'm a little warm or my clothes are comfortable. Notice those things. Three things you
ear. Now as I'm talking and you're paying attention to this, you're not listening to any of the other sounds in the room, but there's a lot of things going on. There's an air conditioning unit or something over here running. Um, maybe if I was really quiet, we might hear the traffic or a big truck go by or something. So think about the three things that you can hear, two things that you can smell, and then one good thing about yourself. So you're going to end that one with one good thing about myself. And that may be, I didn't kill anybody today. <laughs> yeah, that might be the only thing you can come up with, but that's a good thing. You know? So find one good thing you can say to yourself at the end of the day, and that's a great way to end. Then there's another one on there that's a three-minute exercise. Same thing. So again, that's that mindfulness where what you're doing is taking your focus off what's stressing you, you're taking your focus off of the problem and you're focusing very deeply and breathing on this one thing. And that can really bring about a lot of good stress relief. You can use those also if you're uh, afraid of flying, if you're afraid of going to the doctor, anything like that that tends to raise your anxiety, these exercises will work for. So the next thing we're going to do is talk about some tools for your toolkit. And uh, there's some things that a caregiver just needs to know. And one of the things is that your loved one is likely going to do and say things that are going to be hurtful. And it's important to remember that it is the disease making them do that, not your loved one. So you know that old expression, be like a duck, like water off a duck's back? That's what we have to learn to do. And that's a lot easier said than done, and I don't mean to make light of that at all, but that's a really good illustration for you. When somebody says something to you, let it go. All right, let it go like water off a bag. And the other thing is that words and behavior only have the power to hurt them it hurt you if you let them. And I want to just give you an illustration of this or um, what's your name, sir? John. John, hey John, I'm Cheryl. Good to meet you. And and John, you're you pretty tough, pretty confident in yourself that you can handle somebody being mean? Most days. Okay, good. Okay, so let's just say, <laughs> let's say that I'm walking along and I fall and John here sees me fall. Now he's a nice guy. He's going to walk over and go, oh, are you okay? Let me help you up. And if I look at him and say, leave me alone. You're just trying to hurt me. I hate you. He might go, yeah, what's her problem? Right? And he's going to walk away and go through his day and think, oh, that crazy lady, what was her problem? What was up with that? I was just trying to be nice. That's probably not going to bother him an hour from now. He might tell a few people, the craziest thing happened to me today. You won't believe this. But he's not going to cry over it all day or have his feelings hurt or whatever. Okay? Now let's pretend I'm John's wife of 50 years. And he comes into the kitchen and finds that I've fallen on the floor. Oh, here, honey, let me help you up. And now I say the same things to him. Leave me alone. You're just trying to hurt me. I hate you. Is that going to be a different experience? Yeah, absolutely. Why? Because he has an emotional attachment to me and to the words that I'm saying. And what I'm saying to you is you actually have the ability to, to step away from that. You, if you can teach yourself things that, that people often say, Dad would never say that to me. And I'm like, you're right. Dad wouldn't. Or my husband would never have talked to me that way. You're right. Your husband wouldn't. So we need to learn how to acknowledge that the disease that takes over their brain is what's doing the talking and the behaving. And if we can step away from that and remove the emotions, I didn't say anything different to John, did I? I didn't react differently to him at all. What was the difference? The emotional power behind who those words were coming from. So we have to learn to, to be able to distinguish that. So I want you to have double vision. When you're looking at your loved one, I want you to imagine that you now have two of whoever it is, husband, wife, mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever. There are two versions of your loved one now. And it's important to respond to the one who is actually inter interacting with you right now. Is that really dad or is that Alzheimer's dad? And in the example that we just used, if I'm John's wife and he comes to help me and I'm like, leave me alone, you're trying to hurt me, I hate you. It's okay, honey. Here, take my arm. We're just going to get up and go in the living room. If he doesn't let that bother him, he can react because he knows he's interacting with Alzheimer's wife, right? Not wife. But if he thinks he's reacting to wife of 50 years, who would never talk to him like that, it's going to be very different. Why are you saying that to me? I'm just trying to help you. You know I love you. I'm not trying to hurt you. See the difference? So it's so important. Am I responding to mom, dad, whoever, or am I responding to Alzheimer's mom, dad, loved one? All right. And then we want to make those requests appropriate to the person's abilities. Remember, we talked about that, our expectations versus the reality. Can this person truly do this thing I'm asking them to do? If not, I shouldn't ask them because it's just going to frustrate them and cause things for me. 
So words and behaviors can only hurt you if you give them the power to do so. The other thing that caregivers learn very quickly is that everybody is an expert. Well, you tell somebody, oh, my dad's just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Oh, my goodness. Did you see that article in the National Enquirer about eating butter straight out of the pot? It's supposed to, you should try that with your dad. Or, well, or the, the one that I, I dislike the most is, well, you know, if I were you, I would do this. To which a lot of us would say, well, I wish you were me then because I don't know what I'm doing. It, it's hard, you know. So everyone becomes an expert. Same thing as the duck. Sometimes I think most people mean well. I think they don't know what to say because they can see that you're afraid and you're frustrated and confused. And, and we have this tendency that if there's silence and we don't know what to say, we fill that empty space with stupid stuff. You know, think about some of the things you've heard at a funeral, you know, the, the things, that, and they mean well. They don't mean to say stupid stuff. They don't know what to say. So they say things like, oh, your mama looks so beautiful. I'm like, well, oh, okay, you know, and, and they mean well, but it's like, that, no. So uh, things like that. But everybody becomes an expert. We got to let those things go. I think most people truly do mean well. They just don't know what to say. Or they may have seen something they thought you hadn't heard, and it might be helpful. We get calls like that all the time. People say, hey, have you heard of this study? Or what do you think about coconut oil? Or, or I read about this. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to discern sometimes what the facts are and all that. Another thing that's important to acknowledge is that you're actually going through a grieving process. Now, we get that word confused a lot because we think grieving is only if someone has died. That's what you do when someone dies. Grieving actually happens with any loss. You can grieve a move. If you loved your house and you have to move away, you can grieve that. You can grieve um, a divorce. You know, you can grieve what you thought was there because it's a reaction to a loss. And you're losing little bits of your loved one on a daily basis. So it is definitely a grief process. So if you're feeling that or, or feeling like you're crying all the time or really upset, that's okay because it is a grieving process. And then also caregivers have to accept that sometimes we have to say I'm sorry a lot. Despite your best efforts, sometimes things that you do and say are going to upset your loved one. Now that doesn't mean that you did it wrong or that you shouldn't have done it, or you should have known better. It just means sometimes things that you do or say are going to upset your loved one. So you may have to say, I'm sorry a lot. So let's practice a couple of these. You may have to say, I'm sorry I was trying to help. Or can we say that? I'm sorry I was trying to help. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry I made you angry. Yeah, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings. I'm sorry I embarrassed you. I'm sorry I treated you like a child. I'm sorry I made you feel stupid. I'm sorry this is really hard. Now, the thing about saying I'm sorry that a lot of people don't like, there are a lot of songs about this. Sorry seems to be the hardest word. Chicago saying it's hard for me to say I'm sorry. We tend to link the words I'm sorry with I did something wrong and it's my fault. In this situation, that is not what this means at all. You're sorry that you upset this person and you're trying to uh, smooth over a situation so it doesn't get worse. So, I'm sorry I embarrassed you. I'm sorry I treated you like a child. Here, let's go and blah, blah. It's a stepping stone to preserving that relationship and being able to move on to what you need to do. So we got to practice that. Um, some of the tools for successful caregiving or education, like you're here today, I want to make sure you all know about our Caregiver Academy on the Alzheimer's Tennessee website. It's got um, lots of short three to five minute videos you can click on and just watch different topics, whatever you're interested in that day. We've got the Caring and Coping workshops and the FTD workshop coming up. They are on the calendar of events that you picked up. Um, support groups are great for caregiving. Uh, enlist families and friends. Duplicate yourself. So remember we said one person cannot do it all, it's just not physically possible, so duplicate yourself. Um, Alzheimer's Tennessee has a helpline, 1-800-ALSGATE, please feel free to call that anytime. And then utilize those community resources. Uh, in here you've got tons of information about community resources, the uh, East Tennessee Area Agency, on, I never can say it all, Area Agency on Aging and Disability, ETHRA, East Tennessee Human Resource Agency, the um, 
Council on Aging, all of these agencies exist to help you. So utilize those community resources. And then make sure you develop good relationships with your health care providers. Um, please remember that your physician, you have employed him to help you. So it's important you have a good working relationship with him. And if you don't, it's okay to find somebody that you have a good working relationship with because you've got to be able to talk about things. You've got to be able to, to trust that person and know that they're going to help you in caring for your loved ones. So make sure you have a good relationship with them. I already mentioned Caregiver Academy and then the, the found program and other technology things. If you have someone who may wonder, Alzheimer's Tennessee is, is linked up with the folks that do the Medic Alert bracelets and you can get your loved one a bracelet that identifies them, says that they have a memory impairment, it will have all of their information there so they can get that person safely back to you. And other technology, if your loved one, I think when my generation uh, is starting to face Alzheimer's disease, we are also used to the last thing we grab on the way out the door is our what? One's over there. Our cell phone. We always have a phone in our pocket. There are all kinds of, of apps and things. You can put on a cell phone now to help you locate your loved one. The one that I like is called Life360, and a lot of folks I know are using that now because their loved one always has a phone on them. And Life360 can pinpoint exactly where they are. So if a loved one wanders off, you track them, you can call the uh, authorities and let them know, hey, it looks like she's at Walmart and it'll pinpoint you to the road. Really, really cool thing. And then that planning ahead, that always makes you a better successful caregiver. If you wait until crisis strikes and then are trying to make a decision, you're way, way, way behind. So think in advance. What will I do when mom needs help in the home? What will I do when mom can't go up and down the stairs? What are we thinking we're going to do when this happens or that happens? Go ahead and make those plans. And some of those include the home modifications or moving for the, the kind of house we talked about earlier. Um, now this, whoop, didn't mean to do that. Uh, I've got one more thing I want to show you as a tool for caregivers and it, it involves doing a little bit of, of head and neck exercising. So I just want you to uh, look up at the ceiling and look down at the floor and look up at the ceiling and look down at the floor and if you're doing that right you'll look about like this guy on the screen all right and while you're doing that I want you to say the words yes please yes please hey I'm running to Walmart is there anything I can pick up for you yes please hey I'd love to come stay with your husband on Friday night so you can go to that ladies event at church would that be okay with you yes please right? Hey, we've got a group of men from the church that are going out and doing yard work. I know Joe can't cut the lawn anymore. Can we come by Saturday morning and cut the grass for you? Yes, please. Okay? Because what do we do? People offer to do stuff for us and we want to be that strong caregiver and say, no, I got it. We're fine. I can handle it. It's okay. The grass will be fine until next week. Thank you so much for offering, but we're okay. Why is it so hard to accept help? One of the reasons it's hard is when somebody says, um, like the one we used at the funeral, hey, let me know if you need anything. When you're grieving, it's so hard to think about if you need anything. You, you can't. So that's another thing we're going to write down in advance. So in your packet, you've got a yes please list. You can make a number of copies of that. But uh, it says things like um, things that I need from the store, errands that I need to run, appointments I might need assistance with. Hey, uh, Miss Jones, how's everything going? You know, I'd love to do something for you and Mr. Jack. What can I do? Well, you know Cheryl, as a matter of fact, He's got a doctor's appointment at 11 o'clock Tuesday morning, and it is so difficult to get him to the doctor alone. Would you mind riding with us? I'd love to. And most people who offer to help really want to, and if you can give them something concrete like that, it's a lot better than, oh, I'll let you know. And also, they don't know what you need. So if you know what you need, then when those people come to you and say, hey, I'd like to do something for you, what can I do for you, you can tell them. All right, because you'll have that list, home maintenance and others. So you can add to that list and let other people help you keep your cup full. Then we're going to talk about, uh, you've got a handout there about making the most of doctor's visits. So these are just some of the tips. You want to keep a record of what's going on with your loved one. If there were any changes after medication, what new symptoms are you seeing now that maybe you weren't seeing before, write it down. You can put it in a little three-ring binder to take with you. While you're at it, put your advanced directives and your medication list in there, and then every time you go to the doctor, you've got it ready to go. When you get in there for the 10 or 15 minutes that you get to interact with the doctor, you're trying to make the most of it. And how many of you will admit that five minutes down the road, you're like, oh, I wanted to ask about right we do that because it's a very short time but there's a lot going on between those visits so write it down keep that doctor's list and then don't be intimidated you're the expert on your loved one if you don't think they're hearing you say it again 
or maybe ask to talk to them in private. One of the biggest things we hear from caregivers is that you can't talk about the person in, in front of the person. That's difficult. Or that medical professionals are asking questions of the person with Alzheimer's and you're in the background going, that's not what happened. It's not true. That's not true. So what's a really important thing to do sometimes is if you can find time to talk to the doctor or the nurse outside of that actual doctor's visit. And a lot of doctors are getting more on board with that because they're starting to recognize that office visits can be very, very unproductive because they're not really able to get the information that they need. Uh, some people that I know uh, have talked to their doctors and say, can I just write you a little note? And before we go back, can you read the note? Your doctor might be willing to do that. Ask them. And what this lady does, and, and I thought it was brilliant, she uh, writes out what's going on, what her questions are. When she goes and signs him in, she kind of slips it under there, right? The doctor and nurse are able to read it, and they're able to kind of guide their questions around what those concerns are. So it's a wonderful way to do it. So maybe your doctor's willing to do that. Um, you've got a list on there called Who Do I Know? And this is for things like, again, when you're in a crisis mode, very, very difficult to make a good decision. Uh, I've only had to be in the hospital one time in my entire life, which is a wonderful thing, other than having children. But one time I had something come up. And uh, when I went home, I was alone during the day, and everybody thought I was going to be okay, and suddenly I wasn't okay. And I laid there for about two hours because I could not think of anybody that I could call. I, I couldn't. I mean, I knew there should be people that I could call. Couldn't think of anybody I could call. And so uh, I wrote it down. When I finally figured out, I wrote down, here are the people that I trust. Even though I had them in my phone, I wrote it down. And the next time I needed something during that week, I'd look and go, okay, Susie's always been good about dropping everything and coming, so I'll call Susie. So write it down because when you're in that crisis mode, again, even though they're in your phone, it's hard to think about who these people are. Or when you're stressed, you forget information. So maybe it's a phone number you've known for 15 years and you cannot recall it right now. So John who do I know? Maybe people that said they'll drive with us or run to the doctor or run errands or stay with your loved one while you get out. So, and think about your yes please list. Who are those people that if you get really desperate for something, they're willing to help you with that. The other thing we want to talk about is that behavior is communication. So what is the person trying to tell you? What are their needs or feelings and how do you interpret what they're communicating? So the important piece of that is that if they can no longer use words, they're going to communicate with you the only way they can and that is through their behavior. So it's important not to think, I can't believe she's acting that way, why is she treating me this way? She doesn't know. So just try to look at that behavior and figure out what is she trying to say that she can no longer say or what is he trying to tell me? And then think about how you communicate back. So basically it's learning to speak a new language. We need to learn to speak dementia language. And if I can't tell you I'm hurting what are some ways I might communicate to you that I'm hurting? Maybe I'll be holding my stomach. Maybe I'll be like this. Maybe I'll be making a lot of noise going, oh, oh, oh. And you're like, why are, you, why are they making all that noise? What's going on here? Well, I'm trying to tell you something, but I can't say my stomach is really hurting. So we want to learn to speak their language and understand that. Also think about who is the behavior and issue for your loved one or you, residents or staff. Sometimes there are things that our loved one does that just make us crazy, but they're happy as a lark. So it's not an issue for them, the issue is with us. Or sometimes in a facility, the issue is the staff or the other residents don't like this thing that they're doing. So um, are they in danger of breaking any laws? Is it really a problem at all? And it's important to understand that just because we don't like something doesn't mean that it's a problem. All right, you know the difference. Just because we don't like it doesn't mean it's a problem. Some tips for verbal instruction. Making sure you're using a calm, soothing voice, a gentle touch. If you're a caregiver, a professional caregiver, please make sure you identify yourself by name and purpose. Hey, Miss Jones, I'm Cheryl. I'm here to help you today. We're going to go in the bathroom and get ready for your bath. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what you're about to do. And remember to allow extra time for them to respond. A normal response is I'd say, hi, how are you doing? And I would expect you to immediately Dottie, say, oh, I'm great, Cheryl, how are you? Because we're immediate, right? You need to allow about 30 seconds or more. Once you say something to the person, about 30 seconds to give them time to process what you've said and respond to you. So extra time. Uh, remember not to offer a choice when there isn't one. I always love it when people say to small children, do you want to take a bath? Does it matter if they, you're going to give them a bath. It doesn't matter. So don't give them a choice because what if your kid goes, no, you know, what are we going to do? So that's a good example. We often give our children choices when they really have a choice. So be careful that we don't do that with our loved ones. Don't say, do you want to do this? If we know it's something that we actually have to do, 
would you like to take your medicine now? Nope. What are you going to do? So we need to be careful how we say things. Don't give a choice when there really isn't a choice. And also offer simple choices. Think about if you were to open your closet right now and I said, what would you like to wear today? Well, first of all, we got to figure out what season it is in East Tennessee, right? What would you like to wear today? Well, if I open your closet wide and there's like 40 pairs of pants in there and 65 shirts, that is a big <coughs> deal. If you ask someone with Alzheimer's, what would you like to wear? There's a lot of things to process, a lot of words and a lot of clothing options. So give a choice of maybe two to three things. It's a nice sunny day today, Miss Jones. Would you like to wear your pink shirt or your red shirt? Now, what are we doing? We're still giving her some choice. We're still giving her some autonomy and self-control, but we're not overwhelming her with this massive level of choices that she really can't handle. Some nonverbal tips or things, making sure you approach from the front. The peripheral vision sometimes is, is not good anymore, and you may have to be all the way right here before I even know you're there. So imagine how frightening it is if somebody walks up behind you and all of a sudden there's a voice behind you and you didn't hear them coming. Or, or they do this, they touch you and tap you. Hey, Miss Jo, you, you jump out of your chair. So you want to make sure you approach from the front, stay in their line of sight, make eye contact. And then there's a little thing called hand under hand that we do. And would you mind helping? Tiffany? Yes. Hey, Tiffany. Hi. Cheryl. All right. So let's say that Tiffany is uh, my uh, resident or somebody I'm going to visit and she has Alzheimer's disease. The first thing I'm going to do is I want Tiffany to just kind of see my hands are here. It's cool. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not going to do anything. So I'm going to walk up and say, hey, Tiffany. I would say Miss Tiffany because I'm from the South. Hey, Miss Tiffany, how are you doing today? And I'm going to go to shake her hand. How do we normally shake hands? And she gave it to me, so that's nice. She didn't have to. Now, this is how we normally shake hands, right? But right now, if she has uh, any arthritis or anything like that, that could be a little uncomfortable. So what I want to do, and also I'm kind of dominant right now. Right? Hey, how are you doing today? You know, we're going to do what I say right? We want to get out of that really quickly. So what I'm going to do is kind of shift our hand around like that where our thumbs are linked. And when we do that, whose hand is on top now? You think she might feel a little more comfortable? She probably does. As I'm doing that, I'm just going to kind of get down on one knee. Now what are we doing? I'm on her level, right? I'm no longer talking down to her or anything. And she's comfortable. And I might even just put my hand here and just kind of give her a little squeeze because there's something soothing about that. Okay, so now she's laughing at me. So, <laughs> see, so see, she's comfortable, right? She's giggling at me. I made her comfortable. So we want to remember that. So often folks are sitting and we go to approach folks and we're talking down at them. Well, nobody likes that. So let's you know, take that hand, extend that hand, switch it over uh, pretty quickly, get them more comfortable. A lot of times we're on their dominant side. That makes folks more comfortable. And that's called hand under hand. And then we want to remember to move slowly and deliberately and, and not to force somebody to do something against their will. That will always lead to frustration. I don't care if you know mama needs a bath and by golly you're going to get that bath in. If you try and she starts resisting, the more you push the harder she's going to push back. Let it go and just come back to it later. So don't force them to do something. Just let it go. The other thing to think about is our behaviors, lifelong or late in life. If they're lifelong, like I am not an early riser and I could not eat breakfast at 6 o'clock if you forced me to. So if I'm in a hospital and you bring breakfast at 6, I'm not going to eat it. You're going to call my son and say, your mom hasn't eaten breakfast all week. We just can't get her to eat breakfast. And if he's smart, he's going to say, well, what time is it? And you'd say, 6. Oh, no. Mama, mama didn't eat till about nine. She's got to be awake for a few hours. She's got to have two cups of coffee. All right, so that's a lifelong thing. I'm not an early morning eater. You're not going to change that just because I'm in your facility or you need me to fit a certain schedule. It's just not going to change. So eating habits, mannerisms, late life behaviors, though, are usually caused by a trigger. So the great news is if we find the trigger, we might be able to avoid the behavior. An example of this is if I'm sitting in a great big huge dining hall at the assisted living facility and everybody's in there but it's really, really loud and I just get anxious and irritated and I won't eat. Okay, that's probably a trigger. It's too loud. It's overstimulating. You might move me to a smaller dining room that's quieter and I might eat everything on my plate. So what's the difference there? Just saying, oh, she wouldn't eat. She never eats in the dining hall. Well, let's look for why that is because that's new. Mom loves dinner. She likes to eat. So something's going on here. So let's find the trigger. Some basic don'ts that we want to remember are not to argue, question, correct, try to convince. Don't take it personally and don't let our frustration show. Uh, there is absolutely no reason to try to convince the person of Alzheimer's what the truth is. It doesn't matter. The truth is what they believe. So what we want to focus on instead is responding to their emotion or their need rather than the content. So if I'm just now, uh, if I'm saying that I just talked to my mother and you know my mother has been dead for 25 years, 
don't try to tell me my mother's been dead 25 years because I'm smiling. Oh, I just got off the phone with mom. Oh, did it? really? Well, how's she doing? Oh, she's doing fine. Okay, well, listen, I was on my way to the kitchen to get some coffee. Would you like to come? All right. You don't have to make it a long, drawn-out thing or extended, and, and we don't even call that lying because, to me, that's the truth. If I truly believe I was just on the phone with my mom, I truly believe it. And when you try to convince me mom's been dead for 25 years, and I'm like, I just got off the phone with her. What are you essentially calling me? A liar. And nobody likes to be called a liar, right? So we have to learn to operate within their reality. Some good do's are acknowledging those feelings and picking your battles. It may be worth the fight to get me to swallow my medication if that's very, very important. It may not be worth the fight to get me to shower today. So which one am I going to stand firm on? The shower, I'm going to let go got to get this medicine in her somehow. So pick your battles. And then rethink, is this behavior harmful? Can I just learn to live with it even if I don't like it? Redirect, offering an activity, a snack, a distraction, um, removing dangerous objects, and then reassuring. If I'm running around looking, I'm looking, where's my purse? Where's my purse? Where's my purse? Instead of, nobody took your purse, because that's a common thing, right? Thinking something's been stolen. Instead say, hey, you seem really upset about that purse. Boy, I'd be upset if I couldn't find mine too. I tell you what, why don't you come over here and have ice cream, do this or whatever. I will go look for it for you. Okay, you don't worry about it. I'm going to take care of it. So what have I done? I've responded to their emotion, even if I know it's locked in their closet, right? I've responded to their emotion and their concern. I could open the closet and show it to them, but they'd probably just tell you where the person who stole it put it back in there so we wouldn't catch them. Okay. So respond to the emotion and out offer to help. And then routines and repetition. Uh, driving, I'm just going to direct you. Uh, she has some of the red books over there, if you guys uh, didn't pick them up, called At the Crossroads by the Hartford. Uh, you can evaluate a person's driving. You can take them to the DMV to be evaluated. Sometimes doctors will make that statement and say to a person, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones, you can't drive anymore. A lot of them just won't go there because I don't feel like they really have the legal authority to do that. But the DMV can. Um, somebody called just yesterday and said she found out that you can call the DMV and request that the person be reevaluated, and they'll actually send an official letter to the person's house and say, hey, Mr. Jones, it's time for you to come in and be reevaluated. And, and they won't pass. Having an authority figure tell them they can't drive anymore is a lot better than having their daughter that they taught to drive tell them they can't drive anymore. Right? So I have teenagers. I know what it's like for your kids to tell you what to do. Right? Uh, you can file down or lose the keys. You can disable the car. Um, you can have an authority tell them or go in for the test. Ultimately, setting up uh, alternate transportation means they don't have to worry as much about driving and getting there. Hey, Dad, you've got a doctor's appointment 10 o'clock at Monday. I'll be there to pick you up at 9. Hey, Dad, Jim's going to come by after work today and run into the grocery store. So if you just kind of pre-plan and take care of all those needs, there won't be as much of a need. And then uh, pain is another thing that can lead to changes in behavior. So we want to make sure we're watching for signs of pain. I may not be able to tell you that I'm hurting, but if I'm breathing like that, if I'm moaning, crying out, if you see me clenching my fist, pulling at my clothes, you know, I might be trying to tell you something, fidgeting, pacing, rocking, all those things. If I'm e extremely aggressive or irritable today, please consider pain as a cause of that, and then it can cause changes in eating and sleeping habits. So uh, we are honored that you all are here, that we got to, to support you with this information today. Please reach out to Alzheimer's Tennessee anytime with any questions or any needs. And uh, speaking of questions, we'll use the, the rest of our time together to see if there are any um, particular questions about anything.